Um, I don't think there is a single way to get into type design. Uh, some people come from a graphic design background, but uh, some people come from a computer science background. Some come from linguistics, some come from fishing, from historical studies, from neuroscience, from accounting even. Uh, some come from literature, from poetry, from art. I guess some people even get into type for the money. Uh, not really. Uh, <laughs> uh, but type is the, at the intersection of many human activi activities. And it brings together people with different experiences, different way of thinking, and uh, different goals. And I think that's why, as a field, make it so rich, and so complex, and so interesting. Uh, David, I think you're a good example of this uh, plurality, or diversity of perspective, uh, because yourself wear many different hats. Uh, you hold a master's degree in computer science from the Nazareth University in Brazil. Uh, you also hold a master of arts uh, in typeface design from the University of Reading. Uh, you design typefaces. You run a business, Rosetta, which started in 2011. And uh, you develop and program tools for yourself and for others to, to use. Uh, you, you, you complete a, a cross-disciplinary PhD about the visual uh, similarity and coherence of uh, coherence of characters in uh, typeface for Latin, for Siri, and Tenagri. Uh, you also co-run an uh, online research journal called Design Regression. Uh, and uh, some say you were once jumped in a queue by Milan Kutura himself. Uh, I have no idea how you will feel fit all of that in a single presentation. Uh, good luck. Uh, please welcome David Rutina. my PhD, so it might be kind of hard, but if we get through that fast, then it will be fun again. Okay? <laughs> so that's like the plan. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be fun. Like, uh, as, as some predicted. Uh, so like any type designer, uh, at Rosetta we are fascinated by writing. Uh, the other day I've read uh, one linguist, linguist saying uh, that writing is the most important artifact human is made. I'll, I'll let it sink. It's the most important artifact. Not airplane, not computer, not internet, not the wheel, not bread. It's the writing. And, and there, for me there are two fascinating things about it. First of all, we learn to do it. Oh, well, actually, maybe reading is the more interesting invention here, but it's not artifact. Uh, but uh, we learned it in the past few thousand years and the way we did it is to put like crudely we hacked a center in our brain that was used for something else that was used for spotting contours danger in the dark right so dark uh, contours on a light background and uh, to, no, just uh, really simplifying uh, but I find it fascinating that we relearned ourselves to become uh, basically yeah, intelligent, much more intelligent creatures, much, much more organized, because thanks to writing, there is very complex admin, there are cities. Cities like this would not be able to run uh, without uh, writing, and I could go on. Uh, the second thing uh, is that writing, uh, together with the invention of money, uh, happened kind of at the same time, and I, I, I'm, I suspect it was a time when we learned uh, a symbolic thought. The simple fact that we can give a symbolic meaning to something. You know, be it a little statue, uh, or be it a 
a symbol or be it a coin, we, we learned, okay, this thing represents something that it is not. And, and that's fundamental. Oh, yeah? Sure. <laughs> you want to do like this? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and that's fundamental, symbolic thought. Uh, so I'll go back a little bit more, simple, like, not so deep. Uh, at Rosetta, we focus on multi-script typography. That means we design for a lot of languages, and um, very often people ask us, how can you do that? How can you design for a language uh, you don't speak? Well, that's exactly why we do, how we do that, because it's just based on symbolic convention. We learn the visual language, and we study it well. Uh, we do our research, our homework. Uh, of course, we work with people who, who have done that research. <coughs> we don't actually need to speak the language to be able to create effective visual system for that language, for the, the writing for it. Um, yeah, so the company I run is called Rosetta Type Foundry, or Rosetta for short. Uh, and it, it changed over the years, but currently there are three people in, in the center. Me, Anna, and Johannes. The pictures are maybe too small. Uh, then there are our frequent collaborators and people we published uh, uh, typefaces uh, by. And yeah, uh, interestingly, we very often we uh, work with people who live where they are not supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very incorrect way of saying it, uh, but I like to say it anyway. Sergei Gorov is a Russian living in the U.S. Florian Ruge is a German living in Poland. Slava Yuchinova, about whom you will hear a lot today. She's a Slovak person who studied in Czechia uh, and lives in France. Uh, Borna Zapana, you will hear about him too. Uh, he's an Iranian person who lives in, I think, London and sometimes in France, depending on his visa situation. <laughs> so uh, there are three areas we're uh, kind of focusing on. There is going to be a lot of life changes, sorry about that. Uh, we maintain and build a retail library. Uh, currently there are 27 type families, 342 fonts, and 546 languages supported. We won some awards, uh, and so on. I forgot how many scripts we support. It was seven to nine, somewhere there. Uh, and we uh, work with uh, corporate clients uh, and provide them custom services and consultancy, you know, the, the usual. And lately, uh, thanks to my PhD, I started uh, focusing more on, uh, on research. And uh, for our uh, celebration of 10 years, we've published uh, several uh, projects mostly about research or giving back to the community, let's say. So first I'll talk about uh, some of the typefaces. One of our latest releases, it actually happened before uh, COVID, so it's not that recent, is Adelphi, or Adelphi, uh, by Nick Job. Uh, it's a geometric take on a, ger uh, ge sorry, British take on a geometric type. Uh, there is one thing people don't always realize that the modernism, the wave of modernism, didn't spread uh, immediately everywhere in the world. And especially in Brittany, it took a while. Uh, Brittany has a tradition of, uh, you know, industrial revolution. This guy in, in front of the big chains is a uh, is somebody King Don Brunel, a uh, person who is responsible for the Great Western Railway. Uh, for some, uh, oh, he actually co altered the Paddington train station uh, or designed uh, the Crystal Suspension Bridge. Uh, so he's kind of a nice representative of the era of the 19th century. Uh, in terms of uh, type, so, so you, you can already smell the steam, feel the oil on the chains, and all that. So there is a really strong industrial tradition in Britain, and that matters. Uh, from, from that time, a nice representative of type is grotesque. Uh, and we, uh, this is a, from Figgins Foundry. Uh, 
And there's one thing we like about them today is their humanity. They are full of flaws. You wouldn't like, well, maybe you could go with laughter today, but I, I would be like, ah, it's inconsistent. I need to work a bit more. And, but there is something relatable in some in, in their imperfection. Those were very early sensors, so people were still figuring out how they should work. And of course, the result of that is Johnson Sands, Gil Sands. Uh, you can think about like the larger underground, of course, the old underground map, and in the 1933, the Harry Bex redesign. And this is 1933, uh, or 31 to 33, where Harry Beck simplified uh, the map. And still at this time, they, they didn't read Chicot, they didn't read the Neue uh, Typography. Uh, they probably heard about them, uh, but they didn't have the translation. The translation, because of the war, came only after. Uh, from more recent examples is the British Royal Alphabet, designed by Margaret Cowher and uh, Kinnair. So there would be British. And then, of course, when we think about geometry, we think Futura. Uh, and there's or, or what's the French version? Oh. <laughs> no. Yeah? No? Did I get this right? Uh, but the German versions, uh, even contemporary ones, they are extremely ge <coughs> geometric. There's something uh, alienating for me, the, something impersonal. And it's a statement, it's a fashion statement, obviously. Uh, there is all style proportion in caps, uh, very well excited, so that would be typically the case of Futura. Uh, so here is Adelphi uh, by Nick Job, which is quite different, different proportion in caps, much more generous uh, X height. And, uh, and there is a lot of details, I'll try to talk about them later, which are like, there is kind of less of optical compensation, and uh, you can sense hint of the grotesque, a hint of the 19th century, Basically, what Nick did is he took uh, geometric and designed it in a way uh, how it would look in, uh, in Britain at that time. Uh, and on initially, he had uh, these slanted terminals on ascenders. And I told him, yeah, but you know, maybe cool it down a little bit. Uh, and he was like, no, 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 but it's part of the character. So we made it into a variable form. One part is a bit more eccentric. Uh, and, and, you know, we call them display text, but you can use them however you want. Uh, and the sharp one is actually really nice. I'll show you some examples later. So it has certain uh, rock qualities. And, and Nick introduced uh, as to an interesting concept, designing uh, italics, because this is geometric sans, you don't really design uh, true italics for that, uh, so, or he didn't, and uh, so there is just a slanted version, so it's relatively easy to do a uni-width version. That means that the width of the letters doesn't change if the slant changes. And again, it's part of a variable form, so you can change yours, you can tweak the slant if uh, but but the letter of the width actually the width of the letters changes if you change the weight. And uh, Nick being uh, completed, he created uh, Zurich in Greek. Here you go. Uh, and he really tried to you know in a way it's in a, a fitting the modernist tradition. He tried to design them in a way that they would fit closer together. And uh, of course, uh, alternates for better readability, or I don't like that word. <laughs> <laughs> I guess legibility is better in this case. The I versus the, the one with the bars or serifs, if you want, and uh, and the L, the hooked L, 
I think that was kind of spearheaded by Edward Johnson. And I, I, my teacher told me that he was initially hated and laughed at, and um, <laughs> look at us. And um, of course, 19th century was full of cool uh, shop front letterings. So Nick added uh, these kind of ordinals for lettering the art. <coughs> two weeks ago because of Petra Luchikalova. Uh, this is Avery or Avery uh, by uh, Slava Yevchinova. It's narrow sounds, uh, again designed with uh, a lot of uh, language support and uh, a lot of character. It, uh, it is based on the lettering arts of uh, Yaroslav Benda. At the time when she did it, he really was a lesser known. Okay, now now everyone knows him. Uh, all the type designers. And you know, I'll, I'll be honest here. When I saw these things, I was like, who, "Who is this guy? He doesn't know how to design letters." <laughs> 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 it didn't like strike my interest. Anymore. Oh, look at the set. It's just, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then someone actually, oh, a friend of mine was writing a dissertation about him. And she asked me, like, oh, what, what do you think about him? I'm like, no, no, you can't compare that to old Chipman Hart or someone like that. It's just uh, amateur stuff. And uh, I, I said it in a nice words. Um, uh, actually, this friend wrote a, ni a nice article for our blog, which you can't find on our new website, but you can go on this link, alt.rosettatype.com slash blog, find it there. And uh, of course, uh, Petra Ruchikova published uh, this book, uh, kick-started it, so now everyone knows about the other stuff, and that is no longer less now. And also, Suitcase, Type Foundry, published uh, a typeface by, uh, well, Tomasz Grosso, he is the suitcase type hundred, inspired by Yaroslav Benda. And it's really interesting case, you know, same inspiration, different solutions. He took a more of a structure approach, whereas Slavka um, maybe copied more of the, or copied, <laughs> uh, distilled uh, the styling, certain kind of manner, and kind of called it down into unified type system, which is vast. It's, I don't know, nine weights, italics, and um, Siri Greek, and she also did the closed and open versions of certain characters like C or S. Um, we call it, uh, like, they, they're called Avery 1 or 2, sold together, uh, and we refer to one of them as, how is it? Retro chic or smart casual. They choose you want to be retro chic or smart casual with your phone. In, interesting side note, uh, she put in a, this experimental feature where uh, the characters following the vertical current. Um, can you see what I'm talking about? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they, they, uh, yeah, they change. It's not exactly adaptive, uh, like ex conventional thing to do. But uh, it's definitely an interesting uh, solution to the spacing problem. Otherwise, there would need to be uh, too big of a gap between the letters, or they would be clashing. Um, 
Yeah, you can use it for advertising for uh, cucumbers or cornichons. <laughs> and it is pretty neat texture in uh, all the scripts it writes. Another typeface where there is no French connection, but I just want to mention it because it's totally underrated uh, revival of uh, Aldine types designed by Francesco Griffo is uh, Mi Academia by Sergei Gorov. He's actually a computer scientist uh, by occupation, and this is his hobby. And, uh, yeah, uh, and it's, it's amazing the, the level of attention, the sensitivity to detail. He drew, uh, it has several optical sizes, and he drew them individually, no interpolation. Uh, and uh, the display ones, uh, and he, he uses one lab because. He did not learn glyphs yet, I think. Uh, so the display ones are more calligraphic, and, and the text ones are more typographic. And, and he looks at particular uh, contemporary references from Venice. I'll just go through that. So you can see that the display is more crispy and here. Fancy, but not really informative example. So uh, the, the next typeface uh, is uh, our mega project adapter. Uh, it plays with the idea of neutrality and universality. You know, every type designer wants to design in neutral sites. And, uh, so, so we thought about it. We need that because, you know, it brings money. And, uh, and everyone thinks, oh, neutral, that's Helvetica. Uh, but by Max Meidegger. Uh, or that's, that's Ariel. Or by uh, Robin Nicholas and Patricia Saunders. Or that's uh, Verdana by Matthew Carter because, you know, it's everywhere. Uh, and then we thought about it a bit more. And no, neutral, you can't be really neutral. That's, that's just the lie. Of course, it's used just as a label. No one really means it. Uh, because, you know, anything you design, you put a bit of yourself in it, uh, no matter what you do. Uh, so then we thought, OK, we, let's call it universal. Let's try to design a system that will adapt to a lot of situations uh, and, and be basically easy to use, very like, amiable to to different projects. Uh, but then, of course, the, the, the idea of neutrality of personality uh, stayed with us, and we tried to map how, how these kind of forms are being used by designers. And there are two distinct roles, actually. One, for display, relies more on the idea of minimalism or, or manner uh, where things are aligned and clean, certain cleanness and tight <coughs> setting. Uh, I like to describe it uh, with, a, with a person who designed the typeface. For me, that would be someone, some kind of architect, probably dressed all in black, uh, lover of smooth curves, clear enough alignment, and uh, probably we would need to convince them hard to use something else than Helvetica. Uh, the, the other is a, is a text typeface. I would like to say that it, it looks more like it's been designed by a typographer, someone who cares about uh, the ergonomy of reading, uh, who knows about technology and can adapt the letter forms to technology. So uh, there are some differences. Oh yeah, so we designed two typefaces uh, instead of one. Um, uh, one is a bit more rounded, one is a bit more squarish because, you know, small sizes, pixels, and all that. Um, I don't know if you can see, oh yeah, can you see the One has clear-cut alignments, and uh, Rafael uh, mentioned that, uh, that they're actually, like, a, the endings in the display are kind of made a little bit sharper than they need to be, so there, there is actual little bit of manner there. Uh, and the text is spaced more generously. And uh, we copied the idea of a uh, uni-width approach from uh, Nick. Or, like, 
it was a good opportunity to do the same. It's a useful thing. Basically, if you set a page and then design, decide, oh, I want to have this word in italic, nothing changes. So here are some of the differences. Uh, I think I covered everything. And here again, here's what it looks. There's all sorts of uh, alternates for simple single story A. And, uh, you know, when I show this, uh, people are sometimes, oh, come on, it's just a sauce and another sauce. <laughs> they look the same. But uh, I, I like to show them this way, uh, in, a, in a bit of text, and suddenly you see the difference. And it's, you know, for me, this, this is the difference between them, really. It's not in the individual letter forms, it's really in how they deal with text. Uh, and, and there is another difference, uh, the display has more uh, options in terms of weight. There is black, and there is super light. And, you know, there was a time when the variable fonts came, and we were like, nah. Should we do it or not? And we did it. Uh, we made it all into a single font, single file that has all the optical sizes, all the weights, and uh, all the slants. And thanks to that, I could uh, do these kind of illustrations. Uh, and that's another way how to show you. Uh, <coughs> since then, people started doing it, you know, so it's not that cool anymore. But, uh, uh, this is a display, so you can see more weight, tightly packed, and here is text. Less, less weight options, fewer weight options, and, uh, and generously spaced. And this, as we talked about it, and here are some examples. You know, this kind of design. If there is a Czech person, this is a little bit funny. And then, uh, so, and when I say we, I really should say uh, William Montrose and Slava Yevchinova. Uh, and me and William kind of are directed it. William did the Latin with Slavka, and uh, the Slavka did uh, the Cyrillic. Do, 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 do. You know, and the support is not just uh, Russian, it's uh, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Bulgaria, Serbian, Macedonian, and all sorts of non Slavic languages, too, which I don't remember. The and there is Greek, which is just for Greek. And, uh, and then we had time, and we said, OK, Slavka, why don't you do Hebrew? <laughs> and so she, together with Mayor Sadan, who consulted on this project, she did Hebrew. Uh, there, of course, again, with each script, we asked the question, how would the display look, and how would the text look? So it's a, it's, there, it's not like we copy the same principle there. Uh, oh yeah, and then we thought, okay, we have Hebrew, we have to have Arabic. So Borna is uh, our friend, Iranian designer, who designed the uh, typeface Malik a little while before that. He designed uh, the Arabic version. And all of oh, 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 no. Let's say, let's leave this, these two scripts aside to keep it simple, but the, the Latin, Syriac, Greek, it's all in one file. So thanks to that, I could do posters like this. You might have seen it in your goodie bags. That's all done with Python and autom uh, automatically uh, generated. Um, and uh, <coughs> our posters like this. Again, totally automated. Each of the circles represents the number of speakers of that particular language. Nowadays, there will be actually many more. Uh, not because we extended the typeface, but we extended the database. So that's kind of funny. Uh, so somewhere in the audience is a friend I con convinced to come over. Uh, and uh, I promised him some uh, unwanted attention. Clever uh, little uh, day. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. The <laughs> okay. uh, so <laughs> that's that's him. <laughs> uh, recently started a project uh, of his electro bibliotheque, uh, where the where he publishes typefaces and books. 
You may know him as a designer of uh, this uh, quite all right typeface, uh, Immortel. And uh, I have to say something. Uh, I've heard people talking about like all the different voices and typefaces, uh, and you know, different content deserves a different uh, typeface. But actually, I haven't seen a typeface uh, typeface designer to tackle this systematically. I've heard them talking about it, but you know, put multiple voices in the same family. Uh, I I haven't seen that before done well. Uh, I might have missed something. So I think this is a really nice example where you have uh, different voices together, and uh, you can use them in a really nice way, depending on what you want to say. So how bored are you by now? No, not bored. Not bored? I'm gonna bore you. Uh, so, yeah, so I did this poster. <laughs> that was the time when I liked orange and pink. Um, and you know, many people say the best way to understand anything is to teach it to a computer. Uh, at this, this poster wasn't for a computer, it was for people. Uh, so it was. Because I think alternative of that is the best way to understand something is try to explain it to someone. Uh, and this was like simplified uh, version. I think some of the students might remember some of this. Uh, I might have mentioned yesterday during the sessions. Uh, unfortunately, this poster was a limited series, so I cannot frame more. Uh, although I could ask Elliot. Uh, I thought it was neat. Let's do it again. This is a neat poster. Uh, like over, like distilling the, the principles of type design. Uh, but I'll make a statement, okay? Creating all possible letter shapes is actually easy. <laughs> 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 if you have a computer, you can do it. You just, uh, you know, you just generate them. You just randomly generate. All possible, uh, all possible shapes, you know, and then it's just about computing power. The problem never was about creating all the letters. The problem was, uh, and, and by the way, you, I'm illustrating it here uh, with pixels, but you could do the same with vectors. Just put, you know, points wherever you want and keep going for a very long time with very fast computer and you will have at some point all the letters you can draw on particular grid. The problem is uh, creating all the letters. That's where it gets difficult. Uh, so something like this. You know, how do we know this is a letter? Uh, and computers can actually do that already pretty well, but maybe not with every letter. Uh, but we're getting there. Um, and also, you know, pretty much anything can be a letter. So it's a symbolic, right? So you can replace the letter in, in certain contexts and it would be understood. So then there is that twist. So this is an illustration uh, done by Douglas Hofstetter. I'll mention him on the slide later. You know, the, the question of what makes an A an A. Uh, has been on the minds of uh, computer scientists for a while. And, uh, and that's an interesting one, but that's, not, that's still not the hardest one. The hardest one is creating a group of letters that are visually coherent. Uh, that's, that's even harder. And you know, it can go even harder once you start thinking about expression, aesthetic preference, poetics, uh, or technological constraints. But let's let's stay with the keeping the like, keeping the letters coherent, and that's uh, actually uh, uh, that was uh, the objective of the Letter Spirit project uh, that was started uh, in the 80s and the early 90s and continued into early 90s and uh, was run by uh, Douglas Hofstetter, and uh, as a part of it, he came up with this idea. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> what did I do? Uh, 
as a part of the conceptual. <laughs> What's happening? <coughs> contour, the pixels, or however you want to describe it. But Hofstetter realized it's actually not about the shape. It's about certain notions uh, we have about letters. So we know that the letter A uh, is pointy at top, or that, that it has a bar across. So that it has to be, there is this idea of something is crossing there. You have more water. <laughs> Uh, or something is joining at the top. So those are important things uh, for the letters. And, and he called this rows. I'm mentioning it because then now we're going to get into the crazy stuff. Um, so I did a PhD at the University of Reading. I need to mention my supervisors because they were amazing. Uh, Mary Dyson, Fiona Ross, and Keith Stamm. And I missed hyphen is in Keith's name, sorry. Uh, basically, I wanted to understand coherence. And I was interested, not just like, oh, how do you do it with tools, uh, which is great if you're creating letters, but I wanted to know how it relates to reader's perception, whether actually people see that. Uh, so I wanted to connect, basically connect the reader's perception, craft knowledge, and I want, uh, you know, being a big, with a big run from computer science, I wanted to use a computational approach. And I, I didn't look into coherence between different scripts, but I wanted to create a method that could be used with different scripts. So I looked at Latin Zurich and Devanagari, and typefaces for continuous reading, which are very conventional. There is like very strictly, as there are very strictly established idioms. So that's where we, just uh, in terms of academic methodology, one part is empirical, studies with readers, <laughs> another part is theoretical, where I created a model based on craft knowledge, and, uh, and I eventually trained this model and tested it against the data from the readers. So, uh, how did data from the readers came to be? Uh, I ran a series of studies with different typefaces uh, and different letters, where I, I would show people a series of triplets like this, and I would ask them a simple question. Uh, which one doesn't belong? Or which, one, which is the one you would remove as a, being the least similar? Uh, it's phrased there. Let, on, click on the letter that is most different from the others. Uh, and they would see uh, all sorts of uh, actually exhaustive set of combination, uh, of combinations of eight letters. Uh, and the important bit here is you cannot tell people too much. Once you start explaining them what similarity is and what you mean by it, you're basically giving uh, bias to the study. Uh, so you really need to give them as little to go by as possible so they develop their own strategies. And interestingly, people uh, tend to agree you know, on, on the things where you would think that they would agree and that there are some triplets that are tricky when the uh, answers are not clear cut. I won't, by the way, I won't be showing you too much Cyrillic or Devanagari. I'll just focus on Latin here. Uh, so here we are. Uh, just so you know, there was a lot of people who participated. Uh, for the Latin, there was like 600 participants. So that's a lot of data. Uh, I now I now have. I, I should actually open source it or something like that. Uh, 
And this is the letters that were in the studies. So different typefaces, uh, sans and serif, and same question. You know. And once you have a lot of data from people, you can do statistics. Uh, so there are these, in, in my thesis, there are a lot of these tables. Um, I'll try to explain what it means. Um, so the first column is the name of the character. Uh, that's actually Cyril account. There we go. Uh, the second is example, how it actually looked in the study. And the third one is how many people voted for the, that letter to be eliminated. And then the frequency is just a normalized count. It doesn't matter. And then based on that, you know, uh, you can, uh, that's a statistical measure, the confidence interval. Basically, the more people vote for one of these options, the better the confidence interval will be the tighter. This tells us that if they see A, K, and H, people would eliminate the F as the one that doesn't belong on, based on their preferences. I, I didn't ask them how they came uh, to that conclusion, which is important. It will come back later. Uh, and based on the data, you can even go further and you can distill it to something which uh, scientists like. Uh, that's a similarity matrix. So the, if you follow a horizontal, I don't know, you pick two letters, like one, for example, the P on the vertical, and then E on the horizontal, then you will find a number there, 0 0.48, and that number gives you a measure of their similarity. Uh, this, this can be useful for designers, for example, to find confusable characters. Uh, but you can look at the data in a bit more friendly way. Uh, I wonder if I should go geeky or not. But you could look at this as an eight-dimensional space, which you then reduce to two dimensions. Because in math, we can do that. And you, you will do a projection to t 2D, and then you have the letters like this, and basically the closer they are in the, on these two dimensions, the, the closer they are in terms of similarity, which is the eight, properly the eight dimension. It's a simplification, but it's a much more digestible way of looking at it. Or you can distill it even more, or properly, I should say, aggregate it to something I call, uh, what do I call it? Distinctiveness measure which tells you how distinctive that letter is compared to the others. And, it, and again, you need to think about just these eight, because if I studied all 26 and all the combinations, uh, with, I wouldn't be here talking about it today, I would be still running the studies. Uh, so th that's an empirical way. It's been, uh, interestingly, uh, the scientists never did it in triplets, which I think is very important because the context matters for judge, judgments of similarity. Uh, but the things like similarity matrices have been around. Uh, in terms of calculating similarity, there are different approaches. Uh, one kind of cute one is uh, by overlapping letters and seeing how many, uh, what, what's the area, and if there's a lot of the area overlapping, then we would consider the letters similar. Uh, as most of us will intuitively say that's not going to work because we we look at features like series or uh, terminals uh, which can be in different places. How are we with time? How are we doing? We're good? Okay. So uh, I chose a different approach. So we are now in the theoretical part. I chose a different approach which is uh, the feature-based approach to similarity. Basically, you have two sets of, uh, you try to describe letters. I called it letter concepts. You, you describe them as sets of, of, of features. And then you look at what kind of features they share and uh, you know, compare how many they share to everything between the two of them. Features. And that's, yeah, there we are, the roles are back. So uh, in, in my approach, features can be either roles, which are more general, or parts, which are more specific. Uh, parts, as type designers know, are strokes, and not, I call them not strokes. Those would be the things that don't act like they have been written with a pen. 
So terminals, servers, um, what else? Don't about the letter I, for example. That's a non stroke in most typographic typefaces. Uh, and then roles are uh, part composites, groups of parts that are forming certain something, like a bigger part, let's say, or uh, character qualities, like the fact that the character shape is white or narrow. So, uh, uh, you know, these are distilled from typographic literature. I didn't just make them up. Um, but uh, the illustrations, I think, speak for themselves. I would have for each of these parts, uh, so these are parts. For each of these, I would have a very clear definition, name, and then I would go through the 27 letters, 26 letters, <laughs> and uh, for each of the typeface and, uh, and create a letter concept for them. And of course, it's different typefaces would require different concepts for the same letter. Think about, for example, one typeface would have a, a, a double story A and the other one would have a single story A. And then I created something like this. This is just a diagram to illustrate what kind of parts are there and what kind of roles are there. The roles are those with the background and parts have their own code in the legend. It's, it's just a visual way to, you know, to check that I didn't make any mistake there. And here are some of the roles, you know, letters with ascenders, letters with descenders. Very, very obvious, uh, easy stuff. Uh, but already, uh, you, you can already look at the, at the projections of similarity and find clusters. They are together based on the roles uh, or, or the parts. I think here I, I just did it for the roles and I didn't you know, invent them out of the blue. So now you have little representations, little letter concepts for every, little, every letter. So you can run calculations uh, and compare them and say, OK, are these two similar? And if they are, What's the number? Give me the number. Because that's, that's what we can compare with the empirical data where we have a number. So this is, don't try to understand it. I actually forgot what it means. I, I put it there only to illustrate you know, that there is a, some kind of uh, calculation. And, uh, and then uh, you run the model. And now here is the fun part, which you might have expected, you can actually train your model on the empirical data and then try if, if the model can, how, how well the model can replicate it. And, and it turns out it can do it really, really well. So for Cyrillic, it can do it amazingly well. I don't know, I have probably some very good participants. Uh, so, so that's another aspect. The participants were diverse, they were not only designers, there were designers, non designers, um, and I kept a check if they're, let's say, native readers of the script or not. And it, it turns out it doesn't matter. Uh, no, or let's say, it has a significant effect in the data. Um, for That's just for similarity judgments. So you have this model. And here's the cool thing you can do, because you didn't ask the people how they made the judgments, but the model has a way of knowing how the judgment is being made. So you can ask the model, uh, so if I'm comparing the, the letters D, I, J, and uh, people eliminated the D, how did they possibly think about it? This is, of course, theoretical, but it's based on a lot of data. So it says, uh, well, they look at the dot, and uh, whether the letter is narrow, and then consider whether it has an ascender, and where it there, whether there are verticals, strong verticals there. And, uh, and if they had this, this is what the linked the I and J together. And what set the D apart was that it had a bowl, and it has a, it has a closed counter. And, you know, you could do this uh, for basically now for all the letters of the alphabet. Uh, I have all these diagrams in my thesis, which is available somewhere online. I did not manage to write a nice, simple article, but there is a uh, yes. But it's gonna 
it's going to come. So, hopefully. <laughs> um, there is one outcome from this. Um, that I, this this might be like to tie designers, come on, you're telling us what we already know. Uh, yes, but I'm giving you scientific evidence that what you do is what readers perceive. Uh, very most likely. Uh, I would like to leave you uh, with a, well, leave this part uh, with a quote by uh, Edsker Dijkstra, famous uh, computer scientist. Um, Simplifying, there is a reason that I would put it that way. Um, if I ever publish the, the, the nicely digestible article, it will probably go on a, on our journal, as we call it, um, where we try to publish uh, articles about design for reading uh, or research for reading. Uh, it's very slightly peer-reviewed, but we focus on good writing and good content, so you might want to have a look at it. Uh, the chief editor is Mary Dyson. This took me like an hour to get it right. Uh, so that's an example of one of our uh, projects we launched, it, I think, maybe two years ago now. What was it last year? Do you know? I don't know. It was last year, no? Does it say? Oh yeah, it was last year. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there, there are quite a few already. We got some sponsorship from Google. And we're going to publish uh, Mary Dyson's legitimate book online in English and Spanish. Uh, another project uh, we, we're working on is a uh, it's called Hypergold, where we collect uh, information about what typeface designers call language support. That's basically the code points you need to support a particular language. However, disclaimer, code points are not the only thing you need. So, of course, you need to design it well, uh, and just not to make it too tedious and too long, you also need uh, sometimes uh, contextual alternates or uh, mark positioning, of course, good curving and stuff like that. So this is not a replacement for your research into a particular language. It's just a hopefully helpful start. It's built for, for us who want to say that our phones support 500 languages. Uh, and we can do it automatically. So that's it. So that's the little fun part. Of it. I think that might be fun. So the first part was uh, hyperglass. Right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's fun for me. But, uh, so a um, while back, I did a very quick uh, workshop with students <coughs> in my city uh, at the art school. And you know they were scared of Bezier curves. And so I, I told them, well, let's just draw some pixel forms. And they loved the hinges. You know, it was the cool thing the, the current design students like to use. Handjet is a printer like this. You know, you call it onto the surface, and then you roll it, and you print on it. You didn't know? That's awesome. Yeah. Then they use it, you know, on, on, sort of depending on how fast you move it, you deform it, so they love it. Uh, and I love it because it's a design constraint. And so we, we said, okay, this is the grid, go. And they started designing, and basically within a day, they had a like, nice little silly font. 
Well, and I was like watching them, and I was like, hmm, that's cool, that's cool. And uh, I kept doing the same. And then I went home, and at the end of the weekend, I had Cyrillic and Greek. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, as I was watching them, uh, I was like, mm, the pixels, they don't really need to be all squarish. They could be something else. So here is just an idea, just for non type people, this is how it looks. Instead of drawing contour of the letter, you draw with components. And somewhere there, there is one glyph that has the contour of the square. And you keep reusing the same thing. So there is one glyph. Hmm. So what if uh, I example how it might look if you choose the square. What if I make the one glyph very long? And you know, then you start experimenting, you it can go bigger or smaller. Uh, and then hmm two weekends later. So that's just that's normal interpolation. That's that that actually works in the font just smoothly. And that's the one component. Uh, so then if you build from the component the letter, uh, these kind of things happen. Uh, it's all right. And uh, then you can do it with words. And then you can also do a little trick to make them multiply. <laughs> so, but uh, you know, it turns out there is a limit. You cannot have more than 100 components in the font. Uh, uh, some uh, rendering engines don't like it. So I, I built a font with, uh, I don't know how many there are, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 28 shapes, which you can interpolate smoothly. And then you can combine it, for example, like this. <laughs> I didn't know that Susan cared. Design and it was like, well, of course, I should have known there is a term for, but uh, basically, that is. And then I did Arabic, thanks to Google sponsorship. Uh, it, this is open source, by the way, so you can look at how it's done. Uh, it's, it's not complicated, but it's kind of, a, there is a little bit of a fight as well. There's Hebrew, there's Armenian, which I'm not going to show, uh, there's Cyrillic. And most importantly, there are animals. <laughs> there is a cat with stretchable tail and stretchable dogs, and a deer that grows in color of the called antenna, and, uh, and there are owls, of course, and they need owls. And that's really the end of the show. Thank you. to put it all in one single presentation. That's very impressive. Uh, I'm afraid you have to redo your PhD but using MJET as the <laughs> test uh, base. And we'll talk about it more in the next 10 years or so. <laughs> uh, about your PhD and the fact that you're uh, also a typeface designer, which way is it? Uh, do you think the research makes you a better typeface designer, or the fact that you are a typeface designer makes you a better researcher? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about it. Uh, I, I, I think um, being a practicing type designer definitely makes, gives me a certain sensitivity to, to things other researchers just miss. You know, like, for example, testing similarity in context. That was so natural to me, and then I really, you know, didn't see anyone else yeah. doing that with letters. Uh, there are some studies with objects where maybe there is some contextual similarity. Uh, if it goes the other way around, I think it makes me a better, uh, maybe boss. I wouldn't call it art director. But, uh, you know, like explaining people what I mean, it, it helps us in, in Rosetta to have like a language we share, and it helps us collaborate on different scripts uh, in a in a, you know much better way than we would if we were using words like harmony or matchmaking. Yeah. Just a little jab. 
Um, well, you were talking about collaborating, like uh, Rosetta is a team, uh, some are like part of the company, so to speak, some are frequent collaborators. Uh, you showed the map, and it's, uh, I, I don't know if it's a question, actually, I, I'm sorry, but I think we all had to learn uh, remote working and like being uh, in separate rooms uh, the hard way in the past two years, but uh, you've been doing it forever, right? So, uh, so in case you didn't know, there was a pandemic. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we didn't really notice. <laughs> but how, uh, how, how do you, how do you make it work? And um, like, you showed massive projects that are all team effort. I, I don't think a single typeface you showed was made by a, a single person. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how, as a team of people, you manage this kind of huge uh, undertakings? Mm, I, I think we work with great designers. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is that. Uh, it's, I, I don't think I have a great management style. I'm not uh, like a, for many people, I'm not a people person. Uh, but I think at some point uh, we realized two things, and that's too much communication doesn't help. You know, give people a brief, uh, give them instructions, and, uh, and I hate when people do this. We trust each other, you know. <laughs> of course, you know, there is a professionality. Uh, and yeah. after that, we have trust. Uh, so, so I, I mean, really, we work with people like Titus and Borna. I don't need to correct anything after that. Um, and Florian corrects things after me. Well, Slavka, too. So um, there, there's that. Um, and you know, some, it doesn't run smoothly. There, there are deadlines and there are missed deadlines. Uh, so it's not like, oh, sunshine and rainbow. Uh, but the second thing, uh, I didn't talk about any custom projects, but I realized we actually did a smart thing that we don't work on custom projects with designers we didn't work with before. You know, it's something, in, uh, how, how is it called in the management? There would be like third party risk assessment. <laughs> That, there was, you know, in a pitch for a client recently, I was like, oh, this is what we do. We've been doing it all along. So we try to, in a way, the retail projects, that's where we have plenty of time, they can develop expertise in, in what they want to focus on. Uh, of course, that takes their time, uh, but then we, we have the confidence to give them a job. You know, like, uh, for example, Elena Schneider, uh, she, she learned, I, of course, she learned how to design Arabic typefaces already in Reading during her studies, but she developed it further while working for us. If she did it as a custom job, she would not have the, let's say, the privilege of time. Uh, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Makes sense. Do you have any questions? That's a usual question for type designers. You do typeface, or you do several typeface family. On some sale, on some doesn't. You never know by advance how much license you will make from one family. One could be done in, let's say, six months, on the other in 10 years. The one in six, years, six months to make more money than the one done in 10 years. It's completely, uh, there is no CV about what I'm saying, I'm just, you know. You could do a PhD about it. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. Um, so, uh, that's the context of the question. When you have a typeface with different script on it, uh, it means that, uh, for example, you have few typeface where you have, let, let's stay very, very narrow to the Latin. 
not expands. It's already a big question. You do a typeface, uh, there is Latin, Cyrillic, and Greek. To take this simple example. Um, so there is multi question on this one, so it's not easy. Uh, um, you, you, you take certain time to do the Latin. You put the Latin on Cyrillic on the typeface. You, you, you put the typeface on the market. So will be the, who will be the user of this typeface? Does these people use the typeface on this or the Latin? On another, another question based on that, does uh, the people who buy the typeface uh, will use the Cyrillic are based in Occidental country who is not Russia, uh, etc., etc. Or are you able to know that in this project will may maybe take two years, or maybe may probably one year for the Cyrillic and Greek and one year for the Latin, on the full thing? You don't know who uses the Cyrillic or not, so why, to do the, why you have to do the Cyrillic? In terms of you know business on, on income on uh, the value of that, or maybe the last small question about this, you have not need to answer to everything. It's a global. So maybe the Cyrillic help you to have a reputation, you know, to do more script, but in fact, it's not what you sell. Yes. I, I think you you hit the nail on the head with the last one. Uh, yeah, we don't know. Um, and I think generally type designers from Europe have a feeling that Cyrillic doesn't sell. Uh, maybe through our Russian foundries, you know, um, like today and, and these guys, uh, or Paratype, maybe it, it, it sells somewhat. But I think it gives the typefaces a rep certain reputation and they can be more easily picked up by companies that might potentially use the Cyrillic and Greek. They do have the, the consideration, they might not have the immediate need for that. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Uh, at some point, we, so we call that PE, like Pan-European, which is not great, but I'm not gonna change it now. Um, so that means Latin Cyrillic Greek. And, uh, and when we had, let's say, Scholar PE, we would also have Scholar Latin. And that still exists somewhere on my phone, so we left it there, uh, but we stopped doing it. We just said, okay, let's make the PE cheaper, and, uh, and you know, it's a, it's a feature, and so, so we can't really tell who is buying, you know, these specifically for buying Cyrillic or Greek. Uh, we do sell in Greece, actually, for, typically for some uh, book publishers. And I'm not sure if I picked up all the questions. I have one other one on the same <laughs> topic. Um, it's about, um, um, uh, about the income, depending on depending the country. Uh, Europe recently bought, it was this week or two weeks before, that um, you, you need to have a, a salary um, standard uh, among Europe, but it's not the same. So Bulgaria is something like 200, 300, and when probably Luxembourg or I don't know, one country on, on, on the other side is 2,000 something euro for the, you know, the, the basic salary, the minimum salary. So it's very different. So it means that if you have a typeface where you have put you put everything on it. So the Latin, the Cyrillic, the Greek, or the Polish accent, or whatever. The people who are able to buy the, the typeface, um, the income of them is not the same. So it means that you have a typeface quite expensive for a Russian market, market or Bulgaria, where you have Cyrillic, specific Cyrillic, Cyrillic, where is the, you know, the, the lowest income in Europe, versus the people who can buy it are, are, don't use it. Yeah, on uh, we start. Yeah, yeah that, uh, that's a very good point, which I actually wanted to say er earlier. Uh, so we have prepared something. Uh, we have a, we have prepared a local discounts or how would you call it, locality based discount, mm -hmm. uh, which I think should have existed, but it's tricky to do, obviously, yes. uh, for for like small independent foundry. So what we're going to do is for. Uh, 
will will have a list of login countries where the freelancers will have uh, something like a 60% discount, uh, which is the same which what we give to students. So to you know to fix that yes. uh, discrepancy, I, I remember how it was in Czechia. I, what 2004 font? It's crazy. Uh, you know you would uh, yes. get a lot of alcohol for that. <laughs> so. But to, to add to that topic, and you mentioned in the previous answer, uh, you're doing a form that cover multiple writing systems, so this forms address local markets, and it's hard to know how, how popular they're here, and who is buying what, and the income difference is, is is uh, sometimes huge and it's, it's great, it's difficult, but it's great that you're trying to address that. But on the other hand, these multi script forms also are a tool for large international corporations and they should probably not uh, enjoy a, a discount. So it's. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that would be great, you know, if we could have a low. Uh, low rate for local individuals and, uh, and high high rate for big companies. We, that's kind of what we try to do. We have uh, on the website there is just one license which is quite generous. It's uh, up to five users on desktop and up to half a million page views on any number of uh, websites, uh, which makes it like you don't need to really worry if you're an indi individual. And uh, anything about that, people need to get in touch. And then we start talking numbers of users and that, it, you know, then there is a like, potential to, to create a fair price for us. Wow, we are talking money. Mm -hmm. And that's it, I mentioned it as a joke in the intro, but it turns out it's, uh, it's all tied to this. Uh, If I may change the subject to a non-monetary topic. So, with the research that you've done, what, what do you intend to be the use or the impact of your study? What, what do you see being done with it, or what do you foresee being done with your work? Oh, that's, that's a big one. I should have rewrite my conclusion. Uh, I, I, I think by itself it's, uh, it, it is an important study. It's just I didn't quite manage to, to phrase what's you know what's the gist of it. That it really shows like type that's the job of a type designer. Uh, just like working with the coherence to controlling it uh, and that's that's the that's the design there the design job uh, and, and we know what we are doing basically second outcome of that is uh, you know the stroke is not that important that didn't come across uh, but there are other things other features that very often are more important for judgments of similarity and uh, basically by knowing how the features relate uh, or having the ability to study this, we can automate a lot. It could, from on a simple level, it could contribute to quality control. Uh, think about hinting, for example. Uh, when you scale down typefaces to uh, to low resolution, then you need to round up things. And if you know which things are supposed to look the same which we know thanks to this study, you can uh, check for that. Uh, so you could even, I don't know how automated it, it's too good now. It's a terrible example, it's, it's too good. But uh, you know, this, this kind of quality control. Uh, of course it could help uh, in um, automated, uh, how is it? Computer aided design. Uh, you would be designing and then uh, the software glyphs could tell you, hey, Maybe this letter could look like this, uh, or you know, across scripts. But of course, that relates only to conventional designs. The moment you start 
um, designing something more unconventional, everything changes, or everything can change. Uh, and so maybe we will find a way how to train neural networks and uh, computers to uh, to figure out what we are trying to do and help us along the way. And uh, that's, that would be a really interesting direction. Question about uh, computer science. Do you are designing scripts for uh, typefaces for different scripts? Let's say, I don't know, Arabic for Urdu and Devnagari for Hindi. <coughs> um, but it's not only about design, it's also about uh, computing. So, having all of these scripts working with the text processor. So, who is writing the open type features or add whatever type and who's checking them because it must be really uh, complicated. Uh, are the designers taking pride of writing themselves, themselves or do you have people doing this, computer scientists? I was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now we have your honest to so I, I passed on my knowledge there to him. So he would, what, that's, a, there is an interesting aspect to that question, like do designers need to do this? Very often uh, people say, oh yeah, I would love to do this, but I don't know how to program it. And I said like, don't worry about it, we will handle it. You know, you focus on the visual, and it's not always that simple because it's intertwined. Uh, but, so initially I, w I was doing this, and the designers would be checking the quality, whether it does what it's supposed to do. So they, they are supposed to know um, how it should behave, <laughs> the script. And uh, I would be, there are documents you know, online, I would be studying how to program it. And uh, now it's Johannes and you know, designers and beta testers checking. Thank you so much.